My older sister helped me into my white bridal lingerie and wedding gown. An overbust corset, a garter belt, matching panties, and lacy white stockings. A strapless floor-length slip. A rustling taffeta underskirt on top of a bouffant net petticoat. Two-inch white satin kitten heels. And then the dress itself. An illusion neckline and princess-seamed lace bodice giving way at the waist to a full skirt of layers of chiffon that floated atop my petticoats. A bridal veil of more chiffon, edged with the same lace as my bodice. My sister draped the front of the veil over a face that had spent the morning getting a salon updo, a mani petty and blushing bridal makeup. You look just perfect, Lisa, she said. No one would ever guess. Dressed as a woman, I was marrying a woman, but it was not a same-sex wedding. Under all the layers of lace and satin and taffeta and nylon, and my bridal panties decorated with lace and ribbons and bows, lay a hormone-shrunken penis that I had been taught to call my clitty. I was not a girl, but I had been raised and educated as one, and I had long looked forward to this day when I would walk down the aisle in my wedding gown and take my bridal vows. I, Lisa, take you to be my spouse, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, cherish and obey, till death us do part. Yes, I would obey her. I would wear her ring. I would let her raise my veil and kiss me. I would let her carry me across the threshold of my new home. I would submit to whatever she wanted to do to me, or me to do to her, on our wedding night. I would become her devoted, stay-at-home housewife. My entire life had led up to this crowning moment, this affirmation of my femininity. I wanted to cry from happiness as I remembered the twists and turns that led to this day. I never met my father. He abandoned my mother before I was born. I was raised in the suburbs of Portland, Oregon, by my mother and my sister, Jennifer, two years older than me. Mom blamed my father's behavior on toxic masculinity and was determined from my birth to protect me from its evil effects. She did this by raising me as a girl, with my sister's willing cooperation. I think she also did it as psychic revenge on my father, even if he would never see his son in a dress. Mom sent out its a girl, announcements to her social circle, and brought me home from the hospital in pink diapers and a darling little white gown that she saved to show me years later. As an infant and toddler, I wore only dresses, never onesies or baby pants, even in cold weather. I wore Barbie diapers. I played with dolls and other girls' toys, grew my hair long, and had my ears pierced with tiny pearl studs. As far as I knew, my name was Lisa. Until I was five, I didn't know I was a boy. I found it out one day when my friend Danica and I were playing doctor. She usually led our games, and that day she was the doctor and I was the patient. She made me take off my top and show her my boobies, though I didn't have any. Then she made me take off my skirt and lower my Elsa panties. She screamed. You're not a girl, you're a boy. What do you mean? I asked. Of course I'm a girl. Look, I have long hair and I'm wearing a dress, just like you. You have a pee-pee, she said. Girls don't have pee-pees. What are you talking about? Don't you have one? No. She stood, lifted her skirt, and pulled down her panties. She was right. She didn't have what I had between my legs. What was wrong with her? Haven't you ever seen your sister naked? She asked. No, I said. You mean, she doesn't have, she's like you? Ask her, she said. Oh no, I've been playing with a boy. You were at my sleepover and watched us change into our nighties. You. I was near tears. Danica. I'm not a boy. I'm not. I'm a girl. I've always been a girl. I don't know why you don't have a pee-pee, but I do everything girls do. I always wear skirts or dresses. All my friends are girls. Do you sit to pee? Yes. I tried standing, but mom told me to sit, so I always sit. What happened when you peed standing up? It came out of my pee-pee and went in the potty. That's not how it is for girls. We have to sit when we pee, or we spray all over the place. Really? So. I was totally confused now. Talk to Jennifer, she said, or better yet, your mom. 
There must be a reason why you're a boy dressed as a girl. At least you're a cute one. But I'm not sure I want to play with a boy. Oh, please, Danica. Will you please still be my friend? Pretty please with sugar on top? I guess so, but I'm not playing doctor with you anymore. I was so upset that I finally broke down and went to mom. She was in her bedroom, dressed in a nightgown and sheer robe, rubbing moisturizer into her skin. Mom? Yes, honey? Am I a girl? A very pretty one. Why do you ask, dear? Well, Danica and I were playing today, and we pulled down our panties, and I had a pee-pee and she didn't. Mom sighed in a way that I recognized. She didn't want to talk about it. But she did. Lisa! You must never pull down your panties or show anyone what's inside them. You have to be modest. It's not nice to show what's under your panties, even to your best friend. She said I was a boy, Mom. She said only boys had pee-pees. Is that true? Am I a girl or am I a boy? I don't want to be a boy, Mom. I want to be a real girl. The look on Mom's face changed, as if she pulled back inside herself somehow. Lisa, this is complicated. There's more than one kind of girl. There's the kind of girl like Danica, who doesn't have a pee-pee. Then there are girls who were born with a pee-pee, but aren't really boys. They're girls inside. Their moms raise them as girls. As they grow up, they can take medicine to become the women they really are. You're one of them. You're my girl, Lisa. She hugged me. I returned the hug, but from that day on, I suspected I was really a boy dressed as a girl. I didn't want to be a boy. I wanted to be a real girl, like Mom and Jennifer and Danica. How could I do it? Mom sat down with me one day to talk about school. She let me skip kindergarten, but I was supposed to start first grade in September. Lisa, do you want to go to school as a girl or as a boy? A girl, of course. I don't have any boys' clothes. I don't know how to be a boy. I don't want to be one. The problem is, you do have a boy's pee-pee, and your birth certificate, the piece of paper that says you were born, says you're a boy named Leland. My name is Lisa. That's the name we use, but it's not your legal name. I have to show that paper to the school before you can go there. They'll see a birth certificate for a boy named Leland, and they'll expect to see that boy, not a beautiful girl named Lisa. Please, no, Mom. I can't be a boy. Everyone will laugh at me. No, they won't. We'll cut your hair short and put you in trousers, and you'll look like a boy. No, Mom. Don't cut my hair. I'll wear pants if I have to, but please, please, please don't cut my hair. She sighed. All right. I'll buy you some boys' clothes, and we'll tie your hair back in a low ponytail with no ribbons, the way boys with long hair wear it. Even so, some kids might make fun of you. I don't care. Do I have to wear boys' underpants? Yes, you do, honey. Oh, mom. They look so uncomfortable. I'll find the nicest ones I can. The nicest boys' underpants that mom could find were a lot less comfortable than my usual panties, and the jeans were awful. I'd never worn trousers before, and hated the feeling of stiff, heavy cloth wrapped around both of my legs. With them I wore a t-shirt with a logo for some sports team I'd never heard of. It was the most boring outfit I'd ever had to wear. The sight in my mirror made me want to cry for my lost prettiness. Mom brushed my hair and used a rubber band to catch it in a low ponytail, not the high ponytail or pigtails I was used to wearing. A rubber band, Mom? It'll get tangled up in my hair. Can't I use a scrunchie? No. Leland. Boys don't wear scrunchies. I blinked back tears. Boys don't get to wear anything nice, and I don't want to be called Leland. She thought. What if we called you Lee instead, short for Leland? Lee can be a boy's name or a girl's name, and it sounds more like Lisa. I'll tell the school you go by Lee. Mom drove me to school on the first day and walked me to the office, where I found out my room number. I was used to adults telling me I was pretty when they met me, but the lady in the office barely looked at me in my drab boy's clothes. 
be a good boy, Lee, Mom said. She gave me a hug and kiss and was gone. An older girl walked me to my room. Unlike most of the girls I saw in the halls, she was wearing a dress. I told her it was a flattering color for her. She gave me a weird look and didn't reply. The teacher sat me at one of several tables in the room. Most of the other kids at my table were boys. They stared at me, and one of them said, Nice hair, Susie. My name's not Susie, I replied. What is it? Alice? Marcia? Taylor? None of those. It's Lee. I'm a boy. Are you, Susie? How long did you spend brushing your hair this morning? I didn't brush it, my mom did. Oh, that must have been a pretty sight. Mom brushing Susie's hair. I'm not Susie. The teacher's voice cut in. Quiet, boys. All right, everyone, let's all introduce ourselves. When I point to you, tell us all what you want us to call you, and one thing about yourself. Starting with, she looked at a sheet of paper. Ada. Ada's thing about herself was that she liked to make cookies. One by one, kids introduced themselves. Half the boys at my table said their thing was one sport or another. The rest named various computer games. When it was my turn, the thing I said about myself was that I wanted to be a teacher someday. Hairdresser, more like, said Shane, the boy who called me Susie. A few of the kids around him giggled. The day didn't get better from there. When our teacher, Ms. Magistra, wasn't leading a group activity, some of the girls in the room admired my hair and asked me what shampoo and conditioner I used. When I told them, they laughed at me. Boys don't condition their hair, said one of them, a bossy blonde named Marie. Most don't need to. They wear it short, I said. Yeah, so what's wrong with you? You've got prettier hair than any of us. Mom taught me to thank people for compliments. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Susie, said Marie. Some of the girls giggled. Don't be mean, said Danica. His name is Lee. What, is he your boyfriend? Marie said. Miss Virage Kirku, Curva, Danica said. I had no idea what she meant, but it didn't sound nice. Ms. Magistra called us to attention, ending Marie's teasing for the moment. It resumed at lunchtime, when Marie and Shane made fun of the way I walked. You walk like a girl, Marie said. Look at you, with your prissy elbows and limp wrists. Susie's a floozy, Shane said. Shake your hair for us, Susie, and said. Stop it. I'm not Susie. I stamped my foot, and they laughed. By the end of the day, I was fed up with wearing boys' clothes, fed up with trying to act like a boy, fed up with my classmates except for Danica, the only one who came to my defense. Not that it worked. From the remarks and looks directed at me, it was clear that most of the kids regarded me as a sissy boy and thus a target for ridicule. I barely kept from crying, which would have been a devastating final blow to my image. I burst into tears after school when I climbed into Mom's car. What's the matter, Lee? I hate school, Mom. I cried. You poor thing. What happened? It was awful. They made fun of me for having long hair. They called me Susie for no reason. They made fun of the way I walk. They called me a sissy. Oh, honey. Mom reached over and hugged me. You've been my little girl for so long that it's hard for you to be a boy. Why do I have to be a boy? Why can't I be a girl? Well, because if you wore a dress to school, you'd have even more problems. Some people don't like the idea of boys wearing dresses. They might beat you up. It would certainly be worse for you than today. That's not fair. Life isn't always fair, Lee. Can you please call me Lisa when I'm not at school? And can I change into a dress as soon as we get home? Mom sighed. Yes, dear. I didn't want to go back to that school ever again, but mom made me go for the rest of the week. Then we'll talk about it, she said. It was awful. Marie, Shane, and then made fun of me non-stop, and the other kids picked up on it. 
Soon half the kids in my class were calling me Susie when Ms. Magistra wasn't around. A gang of girls led by Marie grabbed me in the hall one day, hustled me into a girl's bathroom, and held me still while Marie wove my ponytail into a long braid and tied it off with my rubber band. I wondered whether to scream or something, but didn't want things to get worse. They let me go. I ran out of the girl's bathroom and almost straight into a teacher I didn't know. Whoa, there, young lady, she said. What's the matter? I was at school. I had to keep up the pretense. I, I'm not a young lady, I said. I'm Lee Featherly. She took a closer look at me. Are you a boy? Why is your hair in a braid? Some girls pushed me into the bathroom and held me while Marie braided my hair. Why would they do that? They hate me. They make fun of me because I have long hair. You certainly do. Have you thought about cutting it shorter? I don't want to. Wait here while I look inside. She went into the bathroom. A minute or two passed before she came out. The girls inside are using the bathroom normally. They say you walked inside, told them you weren't a boy, and tried to use one of the stalls. Did you do that? No. They dragged me in there, and I didn't tell them I'm not a boy. They're lying. Did you braid your hair yourself, Lee? No. I don't know how. Which was a lie, but most boys don't know how to braid hair. Marie did it. She sighed. It doesn't matter who did it. Boys usually don't wear long hair in braids. No wonder I thought you were a girl. Let's fix your hair. She pulled off the rubber band and, in a few moments, undid all the braids. My hair cascaded over my shoulders, slightly wavy from having been braided. My goodness, you have beautiful hair, the teacher said. I'm Ms. Harris. I'm going to have to report this incident to the office. Boys are not allowed in girls' bathrooms unless they identify as a girl and dress like one. Since you're wearing boys' clothes, you're not allowed in the girls' bathroom. Arg! It was my situation exactly except I didn't dare admit it. I did dare to ask a question. You mean, if a boy came to school in a dress and said he thought he was a girl, he could use the girls' bathrooms? Technically, yes. Why do you ask, Lee? Are you by any chance one of those boys? Oh, no, I lied. I just wondered. I see. Whose class are you in? She walked me to my room, where I took my seat with the boys, looking more like a girl than ever, with my unbound hair flowing all around me. Miss Harris spoke quietly to Ms. Magistra, who looked at me and nodded. Ms. Harris left the room. All right, everyone, my teacher said, giving me a curious glance, it's reading time. She read us a new story of Barbara the Elephant, who was organizing the female elephants to fight the colonialists' barbarous trade in ivory. Someone from the office called mom at home while I was at school the next day. That night, she asked me what happened in the girls' bathroom. I told her the truth. Oh, Lisa, she said. I was happy to hear her use my real name. What are we going to do? Would you be willing to cut your hair? Please, mom, no. I feel like I'm Lisa, not Lee. I don't want you to turn me into Lee. I don't want to be a boy. I don't want to wear awful boy clothes. Do I have to go back to school? I'm going to meet with your teacher and a counselor and the principal on Friday, she said. We'll see what we can figure out. I somehow got through the rest of the week, wearing boys' clothes, tying back my ponytail with a horrible rubber band, avoiding my tormentors as much as I could, tired of being called Susie by kids I didn't like. After school ended Friday, I climbed into mom's car, feeling like a limp noodle, hoping she didn't have bad news. I had that meeting at school today, she said. It was a total waste of time. They were saying you sexually harassed a group of girls in the girls' bathroom. I told them what you told me, that the girls harassed you, not the other way around. They didn't believe me. They said if it happens again, they'll have to involve the school district. They think it was all your fault. It wasn't. It was theirs. Please believe me. I do, Lisa. I'm starting to think it was a mistake to send you to public school. I agree. Do I have to go back? 
Well, I did some research. There's another school you could go to. It's called Mount Rose School. What kind of school is it? A girl's school. Don't I have to be a boy at school? Not at Mount Rose, dear. They let boys who identify as girls attend. The boys have to dress and behave like girls, and they have to promise to take medicine when they're older. What kind of medicine? Medicine to turn you from a boy into a girl. They have medicine like that, mom? I want it. You can't take it yet, not till you're older. We have to wait. You might change your mind by then. I'll never change my mind, mom. I'm a girl named Lisa, not a boy named Leland. We'll see, but meanwhile, do you want to go to Mount Rose School as Lisa? You'll have to wear the school uniform. What's the uniform like, mom? Oh, I think you'll love it, Lisa. It's a pleated skirt, a white blouse, and the cutest blue blazer. Under it, panties, a camisole, and a slip. And the boys have to wear it, too? Yes. They have to dress just like the girls. The skirt is very short. You'll have to be careful when you sit down in it. Keep your knees together. I will, Mom, and I'll sit up very straight, with my hands folded nicely in my lap, if you let me go to Mount Rose. It's a deal. I'll call them Monday. You'll need to visit the school for an interview. Why? They want to see you wearing girls' clothes. How you look. How you move. You should practice your curtsy. I'll look feminine enough, won't I, Mom? I think you'll look just fine, dear. I didn't realize that I would be living at Mount Rose School, not just driving from home. It turned out that Mount Rose was a year-round boarding school where I would sleep in a dorm with the other students. I had just turned six, the minimum age for entry, and would spend up to the next twelve years of my life there, except for holiday breaks when I could return home. Mom said I was able to get a scholarship because my father had abandoned us and wasn't paying child support. I wondered if she was sending me to school so that she wouldn't have to work so hard to take care of me at home. I loved Mom and couldn't blame her for needing to send me to school somewhere. From what I'd heard of it, Mount Rose sounded like the perfect place for me. She drove me to the school for my interview. I didn't want to take any chances, so I wore the most feminine dress in my closet, a light pink confection with puff sleeves, a laced bodice, and a multi-tiered ruffled skirt. Mom set tendrils in my hair and added a pink poof. I thought I looked cute. The school was set in a forest of firs and cedars almost an hour's drive east of Portland, past the town of Sandy on the Mount Hood Highway. A long driveway ended at a gate in a tall concrete block wall. Mom told the guard we were there for my interview and handed him a computer printout. The guard looked inside the car, saw me in my fairy tale dress, and waved us inside. The grounds were a northwest garden of roses, rhododendrons, and azaleas under cedars. The campus buildings looked like giant old-fashioned wooden bungalows. The building closest to the gate had an interviews, start here sign and a small parking lot. Mom took me inside and showed a bunch of paperwork to a middle-aged lady behind the desk. The lady thumbed through the papers, introduced herself as Ms. Wilde, greeted me as Lisa, and led me through a door into a room containing a folding chair. Mom remained behind in the lobby. Ms. Wilde sat in the chair and told me to stand in the middle of the room. Curtsy, she said. I grasped my dress and petticoat with my thumbs and forefingers, placed my right foot behind my left, lowered my eyes, lifted my skirts, and bent my knees. I held the curtsy for a moment before straightening up. Walk around the room, she said. I did as she said, taking short steps, placing my feet in a straight line, holding my elbows against my waist, raising my forearms and letting my hands dangle from limp wrists. My skirt swished around me prettily. Ms. Wilde stood. Sit in this chair. I smoothed my dress under me and sat, keeping my back straight, my knees together, and crossing my ankles. I smoothed my skirts and folded my hands in my lap. Stand up. I rose. She placed a book on my head. Walk as far as you can until the book falls. I got more than halfway across the room before it fell. Pick up the book and bring it to me. 
I didn't want to risk exposing my petticoat or panties by bending from the waist, so I bent my knees and hips to lower myself, picked up the book, and handed it to the lady. You pass the edition, Lisa, she said. You are short and slender for a boy, with small hands and feet and no bulky muscles. Your feminine deportment is excellent for a girl of your age. You exhibit no boyish tendencies. In fact, you are one of the prettiest boys I've ever seen, prettier than many of our genetic girls. I will let the headmistress know. I curtsied to her. Thank you, ma'am. She led me back into the lobby and told mom that I passed easily. Your child's feminine deportment is superb. The next step is to meet with the headmistress, Miss Stroke, in the administration building. She will be expecting you. A schoolgirl in uniform sat behind a reception desk in administration. She slipped into the office marked headmistress, returned moments later, and said Miss Stroke would see us now. Behind a large modern desk sat a woman older than mom, with silver hair, wearing a navy blue dress. She greeted me by name but spoke mostly to mom. As you know, Miss Featherly, we admit boys who identify and present as girls. Lisa clearly meets that requirement. Miss Wilde tells me she has near-perfect deportment. You are to be congratulated, and in light of your family history, we will be happy to admit her as a scholarship student. Thank you, Mom said. I wanted to jump and scream for joy, but I sat quietly, like a good girl. Lisa will be what we call a first year, like first grade, the headmistress said. She'll wear a school uniform, like all the other girls, with appropriate underwear. Like other first years, she'll have four classes a day, clothing, cooking, deportment, and housekeeping. She'll start learning how to sew a dress, cook a meal, be a lady, and manage a household. Mom frowned. Won't she study subjects like reading, writing, and arithmetic? Of course! For years one through six, we teach the three RS as part of clothing, cooking, and housekeeping. Girls learn to read about fashions, follow sewing patterns, follow recipes, and read novels for girls. Years 7 through 12 have a more challenging curriculum, including childcare, cosmetics, sex education, and shopping. It sounds more like housewife or maid training than an academic education, Ms. Stroke. The headmistress' voice was prim. We don't send many students to Harvard, Ms. Featherly. The school's initials are its purpose. What? M. R. S. O. I. C. So it really is housewife training. What about girls who don't get married straight out of school? That's rarely a problem. Men and women alike are eager to marry our graduates. Most of our genetic girls marry men, though some enter same-sex relationships. Our feminized girls are equally likely to marry a male or a female. It's not unknown for Mount Rose students to fall in love and marry each other after graduation, of course. For the rest, the school runs a service that matches our graduates to potential mates, using a compatibility algorithm as input to human judgment. Are they gay? Do they both like garlic? Where are they on the dominance-slash-submission spectrum? It's a combination of art and science. What if a student doesn't want to end up as someone's wife? Then we recommend enrolling the student elsewhere. Mount Rose School produces loving, faithful housewives trained to know when and when not to submit to a spouse. After 10 years, only 17% of our marriages end in divorce, less than one-third the rate for all marriages. Some of our alumni, especially feminized girls, decide to enter domestic service and become maids instead of wives, but that's their personal choice. Girls who know they want to become maids or marry a dominant partner can take a submission class starting in 10th year. My goodness! Mom said. I had no idea your curriculum was so, um, diverse. Mount Rose School is dedicated to inculcating ladylike values and behavior in all its students, including feminized girls like Lisa. We prefer that our graduates be able to stay at home instead of having to work and screen 12th year marriage inquiries for applicants' net worth as well as their psychosexual profile. Our matching service is so successful that we are getting more applications from Asian families. What technology are students allowed to use? Very little, Ms. Featherly. 
We don't believe in screens and follow the latest research on this. Social media are harmful to girls. They're addictive. Girls compete online in appearance and popularity, both of which can be artificially enhanced, and millions of inevitable losers become depressed and sink into eating disorders, self-harm, or even thoughts of suicide. Mom tilted her head. Yes, but don't kids need to learn how to use computers these days? Ms. Stroke shook her head. The risks are too high. Computers aren't hard to use. A girl can easily learn to send email or look up recipes after she's married. What we don't want is our students going on the internet and seeing pornography, and 90% of the internet is porn. If Lisa's future spouse wants to expose her to that smut, they can, but we don't allow girls to do it at Mount Rose. We don't allow girls to have cell phones either, because they're just another type of computer on the internet and make cheating and social media easier to hide. Mom wouldn't let me have a cell phone or use her computer, so this didn't sound all that drastic to me. She let me watch boring kitty shows on TV, but I didn't much care for just sitting and staring at a screen. How does the school handle lying, cheating, stealing, or other misbehavior? We believe in old-fashioned methods. Miss Stroke pointed to a worn-looking wooden paddle hanging on the wall behind her desk. The school's official instrument of correction is named Rosebud. It first kissed a pupil's posterior in 1956, the year of our opening. Rosebud is effective at punishing, if not deterring, naughty behavior. We had the holes drilled in her in 1981 to reduce air resistance. Naughty girls can receive anything from 1 to 10 kisses from Rosebud. More would be cruel. It sounds very effective, Mom said. It is, it is. We also use humiliation for disciplinary purposes. Oh. A girl who misbehaves can be demoted to housemaid duty for a week or longer. She must wear a formal maid's uniform, curtsy to anyone who speaks to her, serve at meals, and do household chores in the kitchens, dorms, and bathrooms. Since she also must attend her classes, she has to get up earlier and go to bed later than the other girls, so she's always tired. It's awful, being a maid. My goodness, how demeaning. Did you hear that, Lisa? If you misbehave here, you can be spanked or turned into a maid. Ugh. I don't want either of those things, so I won't misbehave, I said. Miss Stroke chuckled. Good girl. Do you have further questions, Ms. Featherly? Can you tell us about living arrangements, dorms, meals, that sort of thing? I can do better than that I'll have one of our senior students take you on a tour. The headmistress stood. Good luck, Lisa. I hope you love it here. Please wait outside while your mother and I take care of a few things. Mom soon joined me and we waited with the receptionist until a teenage girl in uniform walked up to us and introduced herself as Melody. She led us around the campus, which had five classroom buildings, a large auditorium and dining room with a stage, and four dormitories. Classes seemed to be in session, but we saw several students walking from building to building, their tartan pleated skirts swinging back and forth. In my pink party dress, I drew a few smiles, but no one approached us. The dorms are named for colors of roses, pink, red, gold, and white, Melody said. They compete against each other in social events and sports. Each dorm holds a mix of girls of all ages. The ground floor is for girls 6 to 12 years old, and the upper floor is for girls 13 to 18. How old are you, Lisa? I'm six. I felt childish in my dress and wished I could be wearing a school uniform. I'll show you the rooms for girls your age. They're nice, though older girls get more space. You mentioned social events and sports? Mom said. Yes. We have two beauty pageants a year in which the dorms compete. We also have a series of dance events through the year in Autumn Ball, Holiday Ball, Spring Ball, and Prom, for which we elect a queen and her court and crown them with tiaras. We have monthly quinceanera parties for girls turning 15 and sweet 16 parties on their next birthday. Oh, and we have soccer, tennis, softball, swimming, and ballet, with teams competing from each dorm. Ballet as a sport? Oh, yes. It requires more strength and flexibility than any other physical activity. 
and the costumes are so beautiful. The pink dorm was surrounded by beds of pink roses. Melody showed us an empty room for girls my age. It was small but pretty, with pink walls and white curtains and trim. It held two twin beds, two skinny chests of drawers, two small desks, a closet, and a bathroom with a tub but no shower. Older girls get a vanity as well as a desk, she said. It's like a decent hotel room, mom said. So much nicer than the dorms in my time. Will Lisa's roommate be a genetic girl, or one like Lisa? Melody looked me up and down. What do you mean? Lisa wasn't born a girl? No, though we've done our best to hide nature's mistake. Wow, really? Lisa, you're so cute. Your roommate might be like you. We have 250 girls at Mount Rose, and I guess 50 or 60 of them were feminized. As many as that? Mom asked. It's a trend, Miss Featherly. Families these days want their daughters to have careers, not traditional marriages. However, more families are discovering that their sons are transgender and want to present as girls, but don't know how to manage the transition. Mount Rose provides a haven where they can explore and accept their gender identity in safety, free from masculine influences. All our teachers are genetic females, though some of our support staff are feminized males who have been chemically neutered. Mom shot a look at me. Um, aren't you concerned about, shall we say, inappropriate interactions between students with XX and XY chromosomes? What protective steps do you take? I had no idea what she was talking about, but Melody evidently did. Oh, that's not a concern, Ms. Featherly. Mount Rose has effective methods of preventing unwanted situations. But Lisa doesn't need to worry about that, not at her age. Now, let's stop by the sewing lab to pick up a uniform for her. I get my uniform now. I couldn't wait. The sewing lab turned out to be a large, well-lit room full of sewing machines and work tables, with some specialized equipment I didn't recognize along one wall. Girls in uniform were working at many of the machines. They looked at me as if sizing up a potential friend or enemy. I hoped they would think of me as a friend. One of the older girls came up to us. Hi, I'm Emily. Do we need a uniform for this young lady? Yes, mom said. Come with me. She took us into a small fitting and changing area where she measured my chest, waist, hips, shoe size, and height. You're a girl's size six, small. Take a seat. She disappeared through a door and returned five minutes later with a bag full of clothing. Here you go. Enough to get you started. One skirt. One blazer. Two blouses. Two sets of underwear, panties, camisole, and slip. Two pairs of knee socks. One pair of Mary Janes. We'll issue you more things after you arrive. Do you want trousers for bad weather? No, thank you, miss. Only skirts, I said. Well, aren't you the little lady? No need to call me miss, you're not a maid. Mom thanked Emily and handed me the bag of clothes. I wanted to change into them and wear them home, but Mom said no, I had to wait. Melody walked us back to our car and waved goodbye, and soon we were on our way home. What did you think of the school, dear? Mom asked. I loved it, because I'll get to wear dresses. I hope my roommate's nice. When do I start? You'll pack Sunday morning. I'll drop you off Sunday afternoon. Your classes start on Monday. Oh, Mom. I don't want to leave you. Oh, honey. It's for the best. You'll get a chance to go to school without any boys to bother you. You won't be the odd one out. You won't have mean kids dragging you into the girls' bathroom. You'll be able to walk right in and sit right down, like all the other girls. I hope so. Girls can be mean, too, Mom. Tell me about it, she said. Mom dropped me off at the Mount Rose Gate on Sunday afternoon with a bag containing my spare set of girls' underwear and a few personal items. She kissed me and said she looked forward to seeing me at Christmas. Not Thanksgiving? I said. No, I'll be in Hawaii, Mom said. You be a good girl, study hard, and do what you're told. 
Yes, mom. She drove away. I showed my acceptance letter to the tall, sturdy-looking woman wearing a security badge. She waved me in. An older girl took me in hand and, after checking my letter, greeted me as Lisa and escorted me to my room. I was in the pink dorm, and as it happened, I was in the empty room mom and I saw on our tour. There was another girl in the room, unpacking her underwear into drawers. She turned around. Danica. I cried, and flung myself into her arms. What are you doing here? Your Maddie told my Maddie about this school. My Maddie wants me to grow up to be the perfect bride and hostess for a diplomat or government official. So she sent me here to learn how to be a lady. But you already are a perfect lady. I will learn from you. I blushed. What's a Maddie? Oh, sorry. It's a Serbian word for mother. Serbia's a little country that used to be a big country called Yugoslavia. Oh, I'd never heard of either. I liked Danica's accent, though. I liked her, too. She stood up for me at my old school, and I thought she was really pretty. I was jealous of her. It was so much easier for real girls to be pretty. I can't believe we're going to be roomies, she said. It's going to be so fun. You always look so nice, and, well, I do, too. We're going to be the hottest room in junior girls. What's junior girls? Our half of this floor, ages six to nine. Tweeny girls at the other end of the hallway. Teenage girls upstairs. How do you know all this already? My mother's best friend has a daughter upstairs, Milena. She knows all about this place. Oh, I hope you'll tell me. Of course I will. Danica took my hands and gave me a kiss on the cheek. Roommate. I smiled, happy to have a friend in my unfamiliar new home. I kissed her back. Roommate. Oh, what shall I tell you about the twelve years I spent at Mount Rose School? Not the boring details of which classes I took which year, or much about what I learned. Our lessons were as dull and repetitious as a housewife's daily routine. Slowly but certainly they trained me to be an obedient wife and charming hostess for a spouse of either sex. I will mention only the highlights, or lowlights in some cases, of my years of education. The morning after we arrive, Danica and I dressed in our schoolgirl uniforms and found our way to the school's vast dining room. There we ate the first of the many healthful but uninteresting meals we were to have there, after which we began classes designed to turn us into perfect little ladies. She and I picked up more clothes that afternoon, a week's worth, and put them away in our room. We now had seven pairs of panties and knee socks, four camisoles, three more blouses, and another tartan skirt. Danica had a pair of tartan trousers, and asked me why I didn't. I don't wear boys' clothes, I told her. Skirts and dresses only. That's because you were feminized, she said. Real girls like me like wearing pants. They're so much more convenient than skirts. Well, I don't think so, I said. By the way, we have the new girl ceremony tonight, she said. Do you know about it? No. You'll find out. The new girl ceremony, celebrated immediately after dinner, was short but not sweet. Since the terms had already started, there were only three of us who were new to the school, me, Danica, and a twelve-year-old genetic girl named Violet. Headmistress Stroke called us onto the stage, had us curtsy to the audience, and introduced us to the school. Then an awful thing happened. Miss Stroke told us to bend over a table facing away from the audience, pull up our skirt and slip, and pull down our panties to the tops of our thighs. I blushed in embarrassment and almost refused, but didn't dare disobey. While the three of us bared our bottoms to the world, Miss Stroke made a little speech at the podium. We welcome Violet to gold and Danica and Lisa to pink. One of our customs is that every new girl should be greeted to Mount Rose by a loving kiss from Rosebud. She held up the wooden paddle I'd seen hanging on the wall of her office. The audience cheered at the sight of it. She swatted me last, so I first had to hear Violet and Danica shriek as the headmistress gave them each a single swat with Rosebud. I heard her step up behind me. A bolt of lightning struck my bottom. I screamed. I heard Violet and Danica softly sobbing from the pain and humiliation. 
Tears ran down my cheeks. Our new girls may pull up their panties and let down their skirts, Miss Stroke said. We hastily adjusted ourselves. Now that they've received Rosebud's kiss, let's hear three huzzas to welcome our new girls to Mount Rose, she cried, and the room rang from the three cheers. That ended the ceremony. Girls crowded around us as we left the stage, and I quickly lost track of all the names they bounced off us, but they seemed friendly and supportive. No one made fun of me. We were all dressed as girls and it was perfectly fine. I couldn't help contrasting it with the reception I would have received at my old school if I'd shown up in a schoolgirl's uniform. As I became familiar with my classes in clothing, cooking, deportment, and housekeeping, I realized that we students provided most of the labor needed to keep the school running. By the time they became teens, students were making all the uniforms that the school sold to parents. Students were cooking the meals, and student maids were cleaning up after them. Students were doing all the housekeeping chores, from changing bed linens to scrubbing toilets. We started out with easy stuff. My first clothing assignment was to sew a button onto a blouse by hand. I wasn't allowed to touch a knife in cooking for the first couple of years. My best friends in housekeeping were my broom and dustpan. As Ms. Stroke told Mom during my interview, we also studied reading, writing, and arithmetic as part of our other classes. We learned arithmetic from using metric and imperial measures and converting between them. We learned to read from cookbooks, sewing patterns, and the classic old-fashioned girls' books that occupied a shelf in every dorm bedroom, Charlotte's Web, and of Green Gables, Little House on the Prairie, The Secret Garden, Little Women, Black Beauty, and a Nancy Drew anthology. More entertaining than our classes were the dances held four times a year, the autumn ball, the holiday ball, the spring ball, and the prom. As an all-girls school, we lacked boys even counting feminized ones like me to dance the men's steps of the ballroom dances we learned in deportment. Instead of inviting a bunch of malodorous males from one of the private boys' schools in the area, Miss Stroke had all the teenage girls learn the men's steps so they could lead the younger girls. I remember my first waltz, dancing with a 13-year-old girl more than a foot taller than me, neither of us confident of the steps, both of us apologizing to each other and finally laughing at our incompetence. There were also the beauty pageants, which took place twice a year. Each dorm had a team of 12 girls, the prettiest ones from each year. They competed against all the other dorms' teams, and the members of the winning team were crowned with tiaras that they could wear to future dances to show that they were beauty queens. Judging girls as teams reduced competition between individual girls and encouraged team members to work together on costumes, nails, hair, and makeup. I was surprised to be selected for the pink beauty team in my first year. I knew I was cute for a feminized girl, but cuter than our first-year genetic girls? For the competition, I had to wear what they called a pageant dress, the frilliest thing I'd ever put on, even frillier than the dress I wore for my interview at Mount Rose. I thought beauty pageants included talent contests and other events to make them about more than just appearance, but our pageants were judged only by two things, beauty and deportment. One by one, we sashayed across the stage in our fancy dresses. We curtsied, spun around to make our skirts flare up, and curtsied again to the judges. When all twelve of us had performed, we left the stage, to be followed by another dorms team. We won! I thought all the other pink team members were prettier than me, but I must have helped or at least not hurt our chances, and I was so proud of us. We all got tiaras, stayed on stage while the other teams left, and curtsied again to the audience. I loved my pageant dress, and was sad when I had to turn it into the wardrobe room. The rules were that a girl could win only once, to give everyone a chance to compete, so after our victory, I had to retire as a beauty queen, though I got to keep the tiara and proudly wore it to dances afterwards. Danica and I were sound asleep one night when chaos broke out in our dorm. We were awakened by screams from the other end of our hallway. We could hear running feet and doors opening and closing. Someone shouted panty raid. A moment later, our door burst open. Two girls ran into our room, giggling, and yanked open the top drawer in both our chests our panty drawer. They grabbed all our panties and ran out of the room, laughing wildly. More girls ran past our door. 
We got out of bed and hurried out into the hall in time to see a dozen girls running out the door of our dorm with their hands full of our underwear. The next morning, a girl from Red brought a printed message to our dorm, if you pink babies want your pretty panties back, ask our messenger what you have to do. Red rules. We asked. The red girl said, you all have to go around all day with your slips showing. Roll up the waistband of your skirt to shorten it. At least an inch of lace needs to be showing. When all of you are snowing down south, come over to Red to redeem your panties. If a teacher asks you why your slip is showing, tell her the truth. We argued about how to respond. Do as they said. Mount a counterattack. In the end, we gave in, shortened our skirts to show our slips, and walked over to the red dorm where we found our panties pinned to clotheslines strung between trees. We all had to walk up and down the clotheslines to find and unpin our panties. When we were all done, there were still a few panties on the clotheslines that no one wanted to claim they were positively dingy so we decided to leave them as a present for the reds. We hurried back to pink to put them away. When we showed up for our first class, our teacher said, Good heavens, how unladylike. What is the meaning of this? Why are your slips showing? Danica raised her hand. Please, miss, the red dorm raided all our panties last night, and they said to get them back, we had to walk around all day with our slips showing. I see. Did you get your panties back? Yes, miss. Well, I think you need to honor your agreement. Keep those slips showing. How embarrassing for you, having to walk around showing off your lacy underwear. At least they let you keep your skirts. Yes, miss. That was far from the only embarrassing incident I suffered in my first year. I vividly recall my first real spanking. It was in a worthy cause and won Danica and me lasting popularity among the pinks. Danica and I decided to get back at the Reds by painting their front door pink in the dead of night. We borrowed a can of pink paint and two brushes from the dorm supply room and somehow managed to stay awake until two in the morning. Wearing robes over our nightgowns, we slipped outside, walked quietly over to Red, opened the can of paint and hurriedly painted the door pink. Our paint job was sloppy, but that was part of the insult. We left the can of paint and brushes on their doorstep and hurried back to our room, so excited that it took an hour for us to fall asleep. We were groggy the next morning when our dorm mother, Rebecca, one of the 18-year-old senior girls, knocked on our door and entered. Not for the first time, I wished our door had a lock. Good morning, girls, she said. I'm doing a cleanliness inspection. Please hold out your hands. Oh my god. We were busted. Pink paint under our fingernails, and we weren't wearing nail polish. Did you two paint the red dorm's front door pink last night? If I catch you in a lie, I'll double your punishment. I looked at Danica. Yes, she said. It was revenge for their panty raid. I applaud your pink spirit, but we can't have girls vandalizing school property. The vandalism was minor and, I must say, richly deserved, but I need to set an example or we'll have more incidents. You will each receive three kisses from Rosebud. If you had tried to lie, it would have been six. Perhaps you didn't know we have security cameras outside all entrances to the dorms. I hadn't known. Stupid. I remembered what one smack on my bottom with the school paddle felt like. The thought of receiving three of them filled me with terror. Miss Stroke delivered them to Danica and me on stage before dinner, smacking us in turn, with our skirts up and panties down. The first sweat made me scream. The second made me cry. I was shrieking and sobbing after the third swat, and was unable to calm down quickly. My butt was on fire. Pulling up my panties brought no relief. The Reds were cheering and laughing at us, as were many of the girls from other dorms. I gingerly returned to my seat, tried to sit, shot back upright and stood throughout my meal, wincing when my skirt swished over what was surely my bright pink bottom. Danica and I slept on our tummies that night. And then there was the time I had to spend a week as a maid, wearing a black satin dress with big puff sleeves and white petticoats and my hair in a high ponytail, having to get up early and stay up late to serve meals and do household chores. Oh, how I hated being a maid. I guess I deserved it. 
I'd been mean to another made one of my fellow students, a little older than me, who had done something naughty and was paying for it by having to vacuum dorm rooms while the rest of us were going to class. I stopped by our room to change from a blouse into a sweater and found a girl in a maid's uniform running a bulky, old-fashioned corded vacuum cleaner across the carpet. I was in a vile mood, having just been dressed down in clothing for sewing a sloppy seam in some future student slip. Do you have to do that right now? I snapped. I want to get changed, and I don't need a stupid maid in my room, getting in my way. I'm not stupid, miss, the maid protested. I'm just doing my job. Of course you're stupid. I shot back. Otherwise you wouldn't be a maid, would you? Out. Out. A senior girl appeared at my door. Just checking on Maid Janet's progress, she said, and I heard you browbeating her. Insulting her. A lady should never do that to a servant. I think a snooty little first year like you needs to be taught a lesson. I'm going to report you to your house mother. And that's how I ended up dressed as a domestic servant for a week, having to curtsy to anyone who spoke to me, and do extra chores, and endure the jeers and jibes of my fellow pinks for having brought a small measure of dishonor on the dorm. I had to get up early and put on my course maid's underwear, including my first corset, a garment that students weren't required to wear. I had to hurry to the auditorium to help set the tables for breakfast, and had to stick around after the meal to bust dishes. At night, I had to launder and iron the aprons I went through in the course of a day and to change into a heavy cotton nightgown that I had to lift to keep it from dragging on the floor and tripping me. I was rarely so happy as I was at the end of that week, when I could take off the humiliating maid's uniform and return to my schoolgirl uniform and to my soft, sweet panties instead of a maid's bulky, uncomfortable canvas drawers. So much for my life for my first four years at Mount Rose School. Classes ran year-round, so I spent only Christmas and a week in August at home with Mom, where she made me wear childish dresses that made me long for my schoolgirl uniform. I spent Thanksgivings at school, feasting on turkey, cornbread stuffing, and real cranberry dressing. A cup of water, a cup of sugar, a pound of cranberries, boil for 15 minutes. Yum! Over the years of our near-constant separation, I felt myself growing apart from my mother or, to put it more accurately, I felt her growing away from me. My August visits dwindled and ended she was too busy during the summer, but was happy to have me home once a year for Christmas. I accepted this as inevitable. When I finished school, I would pass from her care into someone else's, likely a spouse. The thought of having to marry someone frightened me, though it was a relief to know that it was still many years off. The next milestone in my life was fifth year, the year I turned ten and went through the school's tweening ceremony, in which I graduated from girlhood to tweenhood. Like all the other ceremonies at school, it was embarrassing. When everyone had gathered for dinner, all of us fifth years had to line up on stage. Miss Stroke called us forward, one by one, to be tweened. We had to remove our school uniforms, strip down to our cotton panties and camisole, and step behind a screen. There, we removed our cotton underwear and slipped into nylon lingerie for the first time. It was softer, decorated with more lace, ruffles, bows and other embellishments, and marked our transition from childhood innocence to the verge of womanhood. We walked out from behind the screen in our new underwear and made a curtsy to the hoots and hollers of all the other girls in the audience. Off stage, we got back into our uniforms and returned to our tables, where we had to endure suggestive remarks from older girls. I didn't care. I loved the feeling of my new underwear. The layers of nylon slid more sensuously across each other than my cotton undies. We were not women yet, but we would be soon. After our tweening, Miss Stroke called a private meeting of the feminized males who'd just been tweened six of us, including me. We knew each other already, though we were in different dorms and mixed mostly with our dorm mates. It was always slightly embarrassing to be in the presence of other boys like me. I wanted to be a real girl. Now that you are tweens, you will begin a new stage of treatment at Mount Rose, she said. With the consent of your legal guardians, you will start hormone treatments to make you more feminine. Weekly injections and daily pills a testosterone blocker to keep you from getting hairy and muscular, and female hormones to give you a shapelier figure, especially your breasts. 
Your little clitties will stop getting stiff any of us could have objected, I suppose, but none of us did. We all wanted to become girls. That's why we were at Mount Rose. I once asked Ms. Wilde whether parents sent recalcitrant sons to Mount Rose to punish them. She said boys who thought they were being punished always failed her deportment test they couldn't or wouldn't make their bodies move femininely. The shots and pills started to change us not quickly, but gradually. When I was eleven, the areolas around my boyish nipples began to expand and grow darker. My nipples slowly grew larger and more sensitive. Later, the mass of my breasts began to fill out. I started wearing a training bra like the other tweens, but by the time I turned twelve, I was ready for my first real bra ceremony. First real bra wasn't done by dorm or by age. It celebrated all the girls at school who were physically ready to give up their girlish camisoles or training bras and start wearing real A-cup brassiers. Like other rites of passage at school, it required me to embarrass myself, this time by taking off my training bra and putting on a real bra on stage. We had to do it properly, reaching behind our back to fasten the hooks and eyes, and I wasn't the only girl to fumble with them. Our struggles led to much laughter and banter from the rest of the girls, especially the older girls who were well ahead of us in terms of breast development. When I turned 13, in my eighth year, I officially left tweenhood and entered my teenhood years. As a teen, I moved up to the younger end of the upper floor of our dorm and started receiving invitations to teen-only events that were a lot more fun than what young girls and tweens were allowed to do. Teens could attend two monthly celebrations, the Quincianera party for girls who were turning 15, and the Sweet 16 party for girls who were turning 16. Both events required special costumes provided by the school. The Quincianera celebrations were for everyone, not just the Latina girls familiar with the tradition. The celebrants wore bouffant gowns that looked like pastel-colored wedding dresses, and their guests wore colorful party frocks. Wearing a party dress was much more fun than wearing our boring old-school uniforms, but I could hardly wait until it was my turn to wear a quinceanera gown. Some girls wore hoop skirts under their gown, while others wore masses of crinoline petticoats instead. I knew that I would choose the petticoats. I loved the feeling of full skirts swishing around my legs, instead of just the slip and skirt I wore to classes. For the sweet 16 parties, we had to wear teenage girls' dresses or poodle skirts from the 1950s with lots of petticoats, bobby socks, and saddle shoes. They showed us an old movie, Grease, to give us an idea of how kids looked and behaved back then. The genetic girls sighed over the boys in the movie, with their jeans, tight white t-shirts, leather jackets, and ridiculous haircuts. I didn't. I wasn't attracted to boys. I was attracted to the real girls that I strove to emulate. I wanted to be a real girl, but I also wanted to love a real girl. It was weird. The hormones I took were changing my body, but not my mind, or at least not the part of it that controlled my desires. As my breasts slowly grew, my manhood shrank. My clitty never grew into a man's penis and no longer got stiff. My skin grew softer. My butt expanded. My body hair stopped growing. Even so, my desires were those of the boy I had been and in some ways still was. I was surrounded by schoolmates that were awakening new feelings in me. I wanted to find a girl who was attracted to me. I wanted to kiss her and play with her boobies and let her play with mine. That was as much as I could expect. Even if I wanted to do what normal boys like to do to girls, as we learned about in sex education, I knew I was physically incapable of playing a manly role with a girl. I wasn't manly. I was as soft and delicate as a genetic girl. As a result, I was afraid to act on any of my desires, fearful of outright rejection or humiliating failure. Especially with Danica. I was more thankful than ever for my roomie. We were best friends. We were growing up to be dissimilar in ways that I found attractive. She was dominant, I was submissive. She was commanding, I was obedient. She owned and, in bad weather, wore the school's tartan trousers, while I wore only skirts or dresses, even on the rare days it snowed. Danica was a genetic girl, but in some ways, I was more traditionally feminine than she was. I dreamed of taking her in my arms and kissing her, but I didn't dare. What if she rejected me, laughed at me, told me to stop pretending I was a boy? 
I would die. I would be totally humiliated. I would want to disappear. So I sighed, and secretly worshipped Danica not from afar, the way knights in armor or regency gentlemen in top boots and buckskin trousers did in the romances we read, but from one bed away. Two steps would put me next to her. Two steps I dared not take. We continued to attend the quarterly formal dances, the autumn ball, holiday ball, spring ball, and prom, but now that we were senior girls, we had to learn not just the woman's steps to ballroom dances, but the men's steps as well, so that we could lead the younger girls around the dance floor. Nostalgia washed over me as I took a little eight-year-old girl's hands in mine and gently led her in a waltz. Once I had been her, fearful of the big girls but wishing I could be them, instead of the silly little nothing that I knew I was. Between dances, when I chatted with genetic girls my age, they wished they could be dancing with real boys from another school, instead of giving dancing lessons to little girls and tweens. They wanted to slip away from the dance and let the boys hug and kiss them. I listened sympathetically, but didn't share their sentiments. I wanted to slip away from the dance and let Danica hug and kiss me. Ooh. I would let her touch my little boobies, too, and maybe, just maybe, she would let me touch hers. As if. Danica was a star of her year, an A-plus student, perfectly behaved, prim and upright. Our dorm mother named Danica her assistant for our year, so she became responsible for keeping an eye on our behavior and reporting misbehavior. She was vigilant in her duties, and our dorm always had maids mincing about in uniforms that became frillier and fancier as we grew older. When pink girls required a spanking yes even as teens, we weren't spared that humiliation it was Danica who escorted them to Miss Stroke's office, or to the auditorium stage if they required public punishment. Her duties made Danica less popular, of course except with me. I totally admired her had to be on my best behavior at all times, not just to avoid discipline myself, but also to help her set a good example for all the other girls. It grew tiresome, but my grades improved, and I consoled myself with the thought that I was being her little helper, not just a girl, but a good girl. Just as we were about to enter our twelfth and final year at Mount Rose, disaster struck. Danica told me she was leaving the school. I burst into tears. Why? Don't. Please. She gave me a gentle hug. I'm sorry, Lisa, but I have to. My father says he has plans for me that are more important than spending another year at my finishing school. Yes, that's what he called Mount Rose, a finishing school for spoiled girls. Can you believe it? What does your father want you to do? I don't know, she said, getting teary herself. I'm really going to miss you. You're amazing, Lisa, you really are. You were born a boy, but look at you now. The cutest little thing in the dorm. So perfectly behaved, so perfectly feminine. It obviously helped that your mother raised you as a girl, and Mount Rose and the hormones have completed the job. I'm going to miss you so much. Tears flowed more freely. I'm going to miss you more. Oh, Danica. I, I love you. And I love you, too, Lisa but now I have to go away. Maybe we'll meet again someday. Oh. I was beside myself with grief and would have fallen if she hadn't held me in her arms. I leaned against her shoulder and tried to stifle my sobs. Don't cry, Lisa. We knew this was bound to happen next year when we graduate. Now it's happening a year early, but we knew we'd eventually have to take our own paths in life. That doesn't make it any less painful, I said. Be a big girl, Lisa. Be strong for me. I've seen you mature this past year. Now we both have to grow up and live with what has to happen. I wish your dad would wait a year. I don't, she said. I mean, I'll miss you terribly, but I'm ready to leave. I don't need another year of these classes and uniforms and dances with little girls and the punishments. I feel so embarrassed whenever I have to report a girl and see her forced to mince around in a stupid maid's uniform and do dirty work. I felt the same way, though I admit I thought the uniforms were cute on other girls. I just didn't want to suffer the humiliation of having to wear one. Against my wishes, Friday arrived, and Danica left Mount Rose School. I followed her down to the parking lot. 
A black SUV showed up for her, and she loaded her luggage into the trunk. She gave me a hug that I forcefully returned, but she didn't kiss me, not in public with Miss Stroke watching. I waved as she drove away. My eyes were too full of tears to see if she waved back. I was a wreck for a week after Danica left. Our friends, my friends, now knew what was going on and gave me space, for which I was grateful. I went to classes, but they seemed empty and foolish now. Clothing, cooking, deportment, housekeeping, child care, cosmetics, sex education, shopping, what was the point? I was an accomplished seamstress by now. I could plan, cook and serve a formal dinner. I was perfectly ladylike in every respect. I was sick and tired of being an unpaid janitress. I could never have children. I could do salon makeup. I was weary of what we all called abstinence education. Since we never got to buy anything, shopping was just a thinly disguised arithmetic class. I was tired of it all, just like Danica had been. After eleven years at Mount Rose, I was ready to move on but to where? I had no idea what mom planned for me, if anything. I didn't know where Danica was back in Europe. I had no real goals or ambitions of my own. I'd been taught to be someone's perfect housewife, but whose? Since I didn't have a phone or computer, I decided to send a written letter to my mother, Dear Mom, I hope you're well. I'm fine, except my BFF Danica has left school, and with one year left, I'm wondering what I'll do after I leave. Do you have any plans or advice for me? You'd be proud of how feminine I've become. I've been trained to be a perfect housewife, but for whom? I don't know any men and I'm not attracted to them, so I don't want to marry one. But what woman would want to marry someone like me? What should I do? Can I live with you after I graduate? Your obedient daughter, Lisa it took her two weeks to reply, during which I wondered if she'd forgotten about me or wished she could. When her letter arrived, I eagerly tore it open, Dear Lisa, thanks for your letter. I'm glad to hear you're well. I've decided to leave Portland and move to Oklahoma City to live with a man I met a few years ago. He's Brad, a few years older than me, a petroleum engineer, which as you can imagine pays really well. He knows I have a daughter in boarding school and wouldn't mind meeting you someday, but won't have room for you to live with us. I haven't told him that you weren't born a girl. I'm pretty sure he wouldn't accept having a trans person around the house. During your interview at school, the headmistress said they have a program to match graduates with potential spouses or employers. It sounded good at the time, and I recommend you consult with her about your prospects. If you need money, I can lend you a little, but that's about it. Sorry not to be more helpful, but my life is all changes at the moment. I love you and hope you have a happy life. Love, Mom I cried as I read this. I was now more convinced than ever that Mom sent me to Mount Rose to get rid of me. I was a problem. She raised me as a girl for reasons of her own ostensibly to protect me from my absent father's toxic masculinity, but when I grew up to be a boy who wanted to be a girl, she must have regretted her decision. While she was supportive in her own way, letting me wear dresses at home, she tried to get me to cut my hair and sent me to public school in horrible boys' clothes. When that turned out to be a disaster, she sent me away to live at a school where boys could be girls and, in effect, washed her hands of me. I made an appointment to see Ms. Stroke late the next day. Told her my story, showed her mom's letter, asked her what I should do. What a shame, she said. This isn't the first time a mother has sent her daughter or son to her school as a way of removing them from her life. I'm very sorry for you. You've coped well you're by far our prettiest feminized girl, and your deportment is a thing of beauty a real success story, by my standards. So don't feel bad about yourself. I do, I admitted. I feel like a failure. No, never, she said. Your mother asked about our matching program for graduates. I normally wouldn't say anything, but we've already had one inquiry about you. From who? I can't say. Confidential. But you can enter your final year knowing that the future isn't hopeless. I hope you get a dozen offers to choose from. I wiped my eyes. How does anyone outside the school know about us? You'll learn more during the year. 
Be a good girl, go fix your makeup, and feel better. Tell you what, I'm giving you permission to skip classes for the rest of the day. Soak in the tub, read a book, take a walk, whatever will boost your spirits. You'll get through this, and in the end, you'll be stronger for it. I hated receiving adult advice, especially when it was right. I went up to my room, had a good cry, took a bath with lavender oil, pulled on my favorite nightgown, crawled into bed, and slept for 12 hours. I woke up early the next morning, feeling better but struggling to accept the fact that I was here for another year with no Danica, no mom, no one but myself to rely on. My life returned to normal. I wore my uniform. I took my classes. I attended the dances. I did whatever I was obliged to do, even if I didn't exactly sparkle at social events. I begged our dorm mother not to assign a new girl to Danica's bed, and she obliged. Ms. Stroke asked me to be the student judge for the beauty pageants this year. I tried to be objective, but when I knew the contestant was a feminized boy, I tended to judge them more leniently. I told myself it was to compensate them for the difficulties I knew they must have faced in life, but really it was just to make them feel better about themselves. I remembered the emotional boost I got for helping Pink win a pageant when I was new at school, and wanted to pass it on, even if it only helped them play second or third, or at least not last. I didn't see mom that Christmas. She was living with Brad now, and she wrote that they were planning to go to South Padre Island on the Gulf Coast of Texas for the holidays. She said she'd send me a present from there, but never did, or at least it never reached me. That was fine with me. She'd been in the habit of buying me frilly little tops that were always a year or two too young for me to wear. I would usually hand them down to one of the younger girls in pink. At the spring ball, I asked Miss Stroke if she'd received any more inquiries about me. She seemed distracted and said she hadn't checked the numbers recently. She said she hoped to have details for every graduating girl before the prom, hopefully well in advance. As the end of my years at Mount Rose approached, I grew increasingly nervous about what was going to happen to me. When the school finally notified us of the inquiries we'd received, I had only the one Miss Stroke mentioned last autumn, and I didn't know if that anonymous person was even still interested in me. Some of the popular girls had received as many as half a dozen inquiries. We knew nothing about the inquiries themselves, nor how the school received them not until one of the senior girls, Megan, showed us a color brochure that included pictures of all the girls in this year's graduating class. The school mails it out, she said. My mother knows someone whose boyfriend got a copy. She swiped it, broke up with him, and showed it to my mother. Look at it! We're all in it! It was a printed brochure that included all 21 of the girls graduating from Mount Rose this year. For each of us, it showed a full-length photo in uniform, a close-up of our face, our first name, and a little blurb. I read mine. It sounded like it was written by an AI. Lisa, 18, is an a student with exceptionally good feminine deportment. She was crowned a beauty queen in her first year at Mount Rose School. She excels in clothing, cooking, housekeeping, and makeup. She is average in child care and shopping. Her measurements are 34-27-33 without a corset. Her bra size is 34B. She wears a size 4 or 6 dress. She is 5 feet 3 inches tall and weighs 122 pounds. She is fully trained to be an attractive, obedient housewife, mistress, or maid. Like some of our other girls, Lisa was classified as male at birth. She was raised as a girl from infancy. She started taking female hormones before puberty and continues to take them. She has not had reassignment surgery. She is rated very attractive on our scale of beauty for genetic females and exceptionally attractive on our scale for feminized males. She is obedient, well-behaved, and somewhat shy. She has been disciplined for only one significant incident in 11 years. I was furious. We were all furious. How many people saw this? Who were they? How did the school dare to send out such personal information about us? How did they choose the six girls they highlighted on the cover as the pick of this year's crop of beauties? Is this how the school solicited inquiries about its graduates by sharing our bra sizes? 
And what the hell was this in my blurb about housewife, mistress, or maid? Were they offering us as concubines or domestic servants? We'd been told we would get married. How on earth could they print that I was male at birth and raised as a girl? It seemed to me that this doomed any chance I had to get married. Who would want a feminized male? A gay man, maybe, but I was neither manly nor gay. What kind of female would want me? Lesbians, I'd heard, wanted real women, not fake ones like me. A girl named Daisy raised her hand and asked an inconvenient question. Siobhan, Hannah, Elena, Rebecca, and Maria, when did you pose for this photo? Megan cut off this potentially interesting topic. Let's not waste time on that now. I'll ask Ms. Stroke to meet with all of us tomorrow to explain this disgusting thing. Are you in favor of that? We were, but Megan later told us Ms. Stroke said she could bring two people, not twenty. Megan chose Siobhan and Maria to accompany her. They headed over to the headmistress office in the morning. Afterwards, Megan told the rest of us what Ms. Stroke told her. That the brochure was mailed only to a select list of pop donors to Mount Rose whose names, addresses, and other information were known to the school and who passed checks against criminal records in the sex offender registry. The screened donor list included a number of men and women who were aware of the school's reputation for training brides and were looking for potential partners. The screening, Ms. Stroke said, helped ensure that graduates of the school ended up marrying individuals who were affluent and law-abiding, two factors that added to the success of marriages. Megan's explanation dissipated some of the anger. Yes, it was an invasion of our privacy, and they should have asked first, but if we wanted good marriages, we needed to be known to the kind of people who could provide them, and the more they knew about us, the more likely they were to express interest. Yes, but what about them saying I'm a feminized boy? I asked. She said no one would marry you without knowing that detail, Megan said. And she said it was a detail that the main thing about you is that you're gorgeous, talented, and smart. My birth sex seemed like a huge detail to me, but I had to admit that it was something that anyone seriously interested in me needed to know. It felt somehow shameful to know that I would also be judged by my feminine attributes and abilities how pretty was I, and would I make a good housewife, and oh, by the way, did you know Lisa still has her male equipment? I'd lived as a girl for long enough to know how people evaluated females. My puny 34B bust was another liability. But when it was about something as important as my marriage, my entire future, well, it dismayed me to think that people would evaluate me based on those pictures and that stupid little blurb. A week before the prom, I still didn't know if the school had any active inquiries about me. I was about to ask to see Ms. Stroke when she ran into me and pulled me aside on my way to deportment, where I was not looking forward to practicing men's steps for the foxtrot. Ah, Lisa. I wanted to let you know we have an active inquiry about you. I caught my breath, feeling my heart pound. From. The individual does not wish to be named, and has made an unusual request. Oh. What request? They wish to escort you to the prom. Unusual, but not unprecedented. In recent years we'd started seeing a few tuxes, not just gowns, at the prom. They were fiancés who'd gotten permission to date their intended brides at the last dance before graduation, but I didn't have a fiancé. A secret admirer? Should I say yes, ma'am? If the individual harasses you or makes you uncomfortable, I will make them leave. Do I have any other active inquiries? I'm afraid not, dear. Probably because I was a boy in a dress, I thought bitterly. All right. I guess I have no other choice. But, is it a man? The girl always has a choice, Lisa, said Ms. Stroke, ignoring my question. She can always say no, the day of the prom dawned. The school's beauty salon couldn't possibly accommodate all the girls who wanted their hair, nails, and makeup done, so we teamed up and practiced our cosmetic skills on each other. My partner was Megan, who was known to be skillful with a hairbrush. She came to my room, and we got into our underwear. We both wore merry widows with garters and stockings, instead of the usual bra and pantyhose, and we giggled as we threaded the garters under our panties. 
We plucked and primped and preened each other until we were satisfied with our looks, and then helped each other into our dresses. Oh, Lisa. You look gorgeous, Megan said. You look hot, girl. I said. I wish I had the nerve to wear red sequins. You are so pretty in pink. So where are you meeting your handsome date? He's not a date. He inquired about me, that's all I know. No idea what he wants with me. I'm not gay. I'm scared. How do you know he's a he? Maybe it's a she. I snorted. What kind of woman would want me? If she's a lesbian, she'll want a real woman. If she's straight, she'll want a real man. I'm neither. I just wish. I don't want to marry a man. Someone knocked on my door. Megan was closer, so she opened it. Oh, she said. A familiar voice asked, is Lisa there? I almost fainted. Danica walked into the room. See you later, Megan said, and hurriedly slid out the door, closing it behind her. Hello, gorgeous. I think you're my prom date, Danica said. She was a vision in white satin with silver trim. She clasped my hand. Oh my god! Danica! We fell into each other's arms. Poor Lisa, did you miss me terribly? She said. Terribly, I said. But you're, are you? The person who inquired about you? Yes, she said. I did it almost as soon as I left school. Miss Stroke promised to keep it secret. She did. But what does it mean? Did you just want a reunion with your bestie? Former bestie? Still my bestie, Danica said. No, I want more than a reunion, darling Lisa. I want to marry you. I squealed in excitement. Oh my god! How can? Are you serious? We're so young! I am perfectly serious. Shall I tell you what I've been doing for the past year? Yes, please. I rested my head on her shoulder, unable to believe my good fortune. I've been working for my father. He runs a specialty manufacturing company in North Carolina. They make components for Starlink satellites. Global internet access, you know? No, I don't know, I said, feeling small and stupid but oh, so secure in her arms. I don't know anything about the internet. Oh, of course not. You're a Mount Rose girl. Anyway, he lost his personal assistant to a bigger company and decided to offer me the job. That way, he said, I can start learning what the company does and how it works and who its key people are, and I can start picking up technical skills. Once I'm up to speed, he plans to promote me within the company, in jobs of increasing importance within all the key divisions, until someday I'll be ready to replace him. It'll take years, but he's in his forties, he'll be around, and someday, I'll be the boss. Oh, I said, not quite following. It sounded like lots of hard work and a bright future. I thought your mother wanted you to marry an ambassador or something. She does, but I don't. I want to be a boss, not a pretty little wifey in a house dress and apron. How ironic! A pretty little wifey in a house dress and apron was exactly what I wanted to be. The thing is, she said, I'm going to be really busy. I need a partner to support me. Like every woman, I need a wife. A young lady, no longer a girl, perfectly trained as a housewife, with all the skills needed to manage a home and be a gracious hostess. A young lady like an alumna of Mount Rose School. I caught my breath, unable to speak, awaiting her next words. A young lady like you, Lisa. Will you marry me? I shivered in her arms, overcome by emotion, barely able to stand tears ran down my cheeks, spoiling my makeup, tears not just of happiness but of vast relief. Oh joy! I was safe at last. Danica would take care of me and protect me, and I would take care of and serve her. I would be such a good wife for her. Yes. Oh, yes, I'll marry you. I managed to say. Are you sure? You'll have to move to North Carolina. We're in the Research Triangle, the Raleigh-Durham Chapel Hill area. Lots of universities, lots of high tech, lots of cool people. Two women living together won't be a problem. 
I think you'll like it there. I don't care where, I said. You lead, I'll follow. It'll be a fancy wedding, she said. My dad knows a lot of people. What do you want me to wear? A fabulous white wedding gown, she said, with acres of petticoats and a lace-edged veil. Oh! I went weak in the knees at the thought. And what will you wear? A black satin tuxedo, tailored perfectly to my figure. And what will happen on our wedding night? She smiled at me. Just wait and see, dear. I wrapped my arms around her neck and tilted my head back, hoping my Danica would kiss me. She did. Thoroughly. Well, sweet thing, she said, it's prom night. Shall we dance?